I want to welcome you again to River Valley Church on Pentecost weekend. And can we welcome everybody watching online right now and some of our other campuses? So glad that you're here. And it is Pentecost weekend, and that's what we're talking about. And um, since Easter, uh, really Good Friday, the death of Jesus, and then Easter weekend, the resurrection of Jesus. If you remember also, Pastor Rob talked about the 40 days of Jesus after Jesus rose from the dead. He walked the planet for 40 days. And then we remembered the ascension of Jesus, which I love that we're focusing a little bit more on the ascension of Jesus. Sometimes, you know, the ascension is kind of a forgotten moment or story. You know, you got the death, you got the birth, the death, the resurrection, you got the baptism of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, but the ascension really is the catalyst or the trigger for what we're focusing on today, which is the birth of the church. And uh, Jesus ascended to the Father. Hebrews 9, 24 says, For Christ has entered, not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. As As Jesus ascended to the Father... The disciples were looking, and Pastor Rob preached a few weeks back. He, he, the angels showed up, and they, they said, so this is a paraphrase, but this is Pastor Rob's paraphrase. Says, said, stop gazing, get the power, and get going. And so we've talked about the stop gazing. We've talked about the get going. Let's go into this world to be witnesses. And, and we've waited for this weekend, Pentecost weekend, to focus on what it means to get the power. And so that's where we're at today. We're going to go through a lot of Acts chapter 2. We are a spirit-filled church. We are a Pentecostal church. And we believe it is a church on fire full of the spirit that is going to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Anybody believe it? We agree? Okay. Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 13. Here we go. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude of people came together. They were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are, these, are all these not who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt. How are we doing those? (sighs) And the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors also from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, there's more Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking and say, said that they, they are filled with new wine. They must be drunk. We're going to continue that story in just a moment. The title of this message is A New Way of Life. New life in Christ means a new way of life. And I'd love to pray one more time. Lord, I... I ask that your Holy Spirit would fall fresh on us. That your Holy Spirit would rest on us and we would be filled with the Holy Spirit today. I pray that each person, each person would open up their heart for what you have. You're a good father. You have good gifts in store for your children. And we believe wholeheartedly that what we read in the Bible is available for us today to accomplish the purpose that you've given us in reaching this world. And so more than information and more than good teaching, we ask that you would transform us from the inside out by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Everybody said. 
Amen. A, a new life means a new way of life. And uh, a new life in marriage means a new way of life. And I don't know if you married people can uh, identify with this or, or resonate with this a little bit, but I remember getting married and, and it, you know, everything was going good. We're, and, and, and then we say, I do, we get married and and it's a, it, there's a wake-up call to if I thought my old way of life was going to remain the same, now in marriage I was mistaken. And, uh, you know, you get a new rhythm and a new, like, there, two become one. And so it's not like, you know, my, my, the, the way I was living my life, and, and, and by the way, this is not a story about uh, marriage, p- putting marriage in a bad light. I love my wife, and we've been married 12 years. We've got four kids. We're building families. It's awesome. Yeah, praise God for biblical, godly marriage. Uh, but I remember this one story. This is an example of like this wake-up call that the way of life had to change. I'm a pretty laid-back guy. You know, I like to fly by the seat of my pants. I, you could call me a procrastinator. Um, and our first Valentine's Day came. We got married in January, and uh, February 14th was coming. And, uh, you know, around the 13th, I started thinking about it. And, <laughs> and I thought, man, I, I just know I'm probably going to get some flowers. We're going to have a nice meal. Maybe we'll do some type of activity. It's going to be a great night. And so on the 14th, details are still coming together. You know, we're just... <laughs> Flowers, I gotta get flowers, go to a nice meal. We, I chose Olive Garden, you know. And for me, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really think about reservations because when you're here, you're family. And uh, that's the Olive Garden motto. You show up and they're ready for you. We've been waiting for you. Welcome home. And, um, you know, Valentine's Day is going. And um, Kaylee, my new bride and my new wife, is kind of picking up on the fact that as we're going about the night, and as I'm like, what would you like to do after dinner? A movie or what, 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 any activity? Like, let's, and she's like, what do, you ha- like, what do you have planned? Is there any type of plan? <laughs> she's realizing I'm flying by the seat of my pants, and I'm saying that to say my new life in marriage required now a better understanding that I can't just live my life how I used to live it, but I need to grow, become better, become stronger, and learn how to speak her love languages. And, and for you that are married, you can identify with that. But being in Christ does not mean I'm going to get saved and then continue the way that I was living. Just my normal way of life. This is what I do. This is how I do it. And, you know, now that we got kids, I'm happy to be in church and, get, you know, give them, give them a little faith background, you know, give them a little faith background. And, but we just do our, we do our thing, how our family's always done it. No, a new life in Christ means a new way of life. And we're talking about the spirit-filled church. This is an exchange that God does. In the book of Ezekiel, there's a prophecy about what God would do. And and it really is this prophecy about Pentecost and really this prophecy about salvation and what God would do on the inside of us as you give your life to Christ. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. There's going to be a new spirit within you and I'll cause you to walk in my way. When you give your life to Christ and as you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it's a new way of life. I'd like to explain quickly what is Pentecost in the Old Testament, what is Pentecost in the New Testament, and then what is Pentecost for us today. That cool? It's a little roadmap. That's planning. I'm growing, guys. This is awesome. (laughs) Pentecost in the Old Testament was called the Feast of Weeks, and um, it was 50 days after the Passover that... um, the original Passover, actually, Moses leading the people of God out of Egypt. You guys remember the story of the people of God for 400 years? They're in slavery in Egypt, and then the Lord sets them free and leads them through the Red Sea. And 50 days after the Passover, 
that first Passover, Moses walks up Mount Sinai and receives this gift from God. It was the Ten Commandments, the law, 50 days after. And, and then God, as a result of this powerful moment, God instituted a new festival called the Feast of Weeks to remember the 50-day moment where God pours out this gift on the people of God. And in Leviticus chapter 23, just to read quickly, um, you know, there's a, a lot of the feasts and festivals that were instituted by God or in the book of Leviticus. It says to, to the people of God, count 50 days to the, to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Seven times seven is 49 plus one, 50. Okay. Say don't do math in public, but we're doing it. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. The Feast of Weeks really was a harvest festival. Anybody been to a harvest festival? One hand. Awesome. Whew. I don't know. We don't do them anymore. Not, not as much. I grew up going to harvest festival as a substitute for, for uh, dressing up and trick-or-treating, which is all good. It was where the dunk tank was every year at church, you know. It got excited. But it was a harvest festival, and it was the first opportunity to give God in response to his great provision. We've now harvested. Now I get to give God my first fruits. And so it was this one-day festival to say, thank you, God, for providing all of my material needs, and now I give to you my first fruits. Isn't that awesome? So God instituted that festival in the Old Testament. There's a word called matan, and in, in ancient times, matan was this gift. In the, the process of uh, marriage and betrothal, they would be living separate, and the groom would give a gift to his bride called the matan. This gift was to help beautify his bride to prepare her to equip her for marriage which is awesome 50 days after the Passover as Moses goes up to Mount Sinai God gives a matan gift to his people and says no more are we going to live like we did in Egypt no more are what you saw modeled before you in Egypt that, that life that you were raised in for 400 years, I've given you new life, I've delivered you, and I'm now giving you a matan gift, which is the description of a new way of life. It's awesome. The matan gift in the Old Testament is the law or the Ten Commandments. And now let's fast forward to the New Testament, Romans 7, 6. But now we are released from the law having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, the way of the Spirit, the way of life, and not in the old way of written code. And so what does Pentecost mean in the New Testament? P Pentecost comes from a Greek word, which means 50th. And so that's why we've been kind of zoning in on 50 days after the Passover. But if you remember, the, the night Jesus was betrayed and when he was crucified, that night, the disciples gathered in an upper room with Jesus and they were remembering Passover. And so the timelines, I love how God ties his word together from Old Testament to New Testament, from Genesis to Revelation. It's all connected. It is one great story of who our God is and his way of life, his best way, and his truth of life. And so it was, it was not so much the, the, the Pentecost, what we read, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's not so much now a harvest festival of material things, but now it's this harvest festival, what we're about to read, a harvest festival of souls. And so Pentecost in the New Testament is about soul winning, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to reach more people for Jesus Christ. It was 50 days after Passover. You know, 50 days after the original one, Moses goes up and receives the Matan gift. 50 days after this Passover, there were 120 in the upper room and they were waiting. And all of a sudden comes a new Matan gift to the bride of Christ. 
And the new gift is not this law written on stone, but it is the Holy Spirit written on the hearts of humanity. Come on, is any spirit-filled believer grateful for a new gift from God, which is the Holy Spirit? It's a gift to his bride to beautify, to empower and equip for the job that we've got ahead of us and for all eternity in heaven. It's an amazing gift. We're going to pause just real quick and talk about who is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it or a thing, but he is a person, the third person of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power of God, Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit is the wisdom of God, Isaiah 11.2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2, 3 through 5 also talks about the wisdom of God. That is the Holy Spirit. And I was with you in weakness, Paul writing, and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of the power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The Holy Spirit is the power of God, also the wisdom of God. As you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, you've got greater power and greater wisdom offered to you through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, he has a mind and he speaks. It's just, good to, it's just good to be aware of that. The Holy Spirit is here, and he has a mind, and he speaks. Romans 8, 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. I love that. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what it is, the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. I love that right now the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. Not because you're asking for anything or, or desperate for something or have a need, but he's doing what he does is interceding for you right now. He has a mind and he speaks. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. It's amazing. Quick tangent, uh, a lot of people will connect the day of Pentecost in the New Testament and the Tower of Babel in the Old Testament. And I love this connection. If you remember the story in the Tower of Babel, I I'm not going to read the text, but it's this story where the, the people, they got this awesome idea to build a name for themselves. They said, let's build a, let's build a huge tower up to God so we can build a name for ourselves, and God gets involved, and he, he jumbles up their language and scatters them across the world because now they couldn't understand. So, so he interrupted man's plan by garbling up their language and scattering them around the world because they couldn't understand each other. Tower of Babel. Are you picking up some similarities here? But God's plan is greater than that. And I'll just pause before I talk about God's plan. There are people here, you're living in man's plan. You're living in your plan. How can I get my security, my family taken care of, my passion, my thing? I don't want the new way of life. I want my way of life. I, I, I'm good. I, I don't need that. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make a name for myself. And, and, and God wants to interrupt that and say, I've got a, I've got a better plan. And then the New Testament, the Pentecost, the people gathered together, not with this great idea that they would make a name for themselves, but that they would wait for the Holy Spirit so that they could make the name of Jesus Christ known around the world. And as they're waiting there, not building their tower, but they're waiting, they're waiting for what Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit comes, and Jesus is our baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Jesus baptizes them in the Holy Spirit and, and jumbles up their language just like the Tower of Babel, but instead of not understanding each other, all of a sudden the, the nations that are there in Jerusalem that are listening, now they, they understand them and they're giving God glory. It's an amazing thing. And then 
the believers who are now filled with the Holy Spirit are scattered to the ends of the earth to make the name of Jesus Christ known. And so I don't want God's way where there's division and confusion and chaos and pride and envy that God wants to interrupt. He wants to interrupt that and remove it out of our life. I want God's way that we would wait for him I open up my heart. God, if you've got greater gifts for me, I want to be filled with your spirit. You've got a plan and a purpose for my life. Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? And would you send me anywhere you send me, I'll go. Anywhere you ask me to go, I'll go. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. And that should be our heart cry and that should be our prayer. It's a new way of life. You know, it's just amazing that people, you know, get saved in our church Just like in the book of Acts, people get saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, get baptized in water, there's there they they receive a calling. And 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 you know, here in Apple Valley, suburban families go, I think God made us to move to the other side of the world to preach the good news of Jesus. The only way that happens is through the power of the Holy Spirit. God is doing it, and it's a new way of life. Well, no, 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 just do that. Don't screw up your kid's school system. You know, they, like, they got friends and, so, so, you know, don't, don't, don't ruin your life. You're ruining your life. No, no, I want a new way of life. I want the way of life that God has for me that looks different than the way the world's living. I'm not, I'm not living for here. I'm living for there. I'm living for the other side. The story continues, and I'd love to read Acts chapter 2, verses 14. We stopped in 13. Peter begins to preach. Remember the, the, the onlookers, they, they were mocking, like, these are drunk guys. They, like, like what, what's going on? And, and Peter, who previously loved Jesus, but, but at the arrest of Jesus and, and soon to be crucifixion, Peter is denying Christ three times. So that's his old way of living. But now, full of the Spirit, having received the baptism in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, now he has a new way of life. And he begins to preach his first sermon. Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. It's a little too early for that. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be. God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. The same Peter who denied Christ is the same Peter who now with boldness preaches the good news of Jesus Christ. That Jesus is alive. And God's promise, way back in in the book of Joel, hundreds of years before, his promise has now come true. It's been fulfilled that he's pouring out his Holy Spirit on all flesh. That's the same Peter that wrote in the book of uh, 1 Peter 1, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Don't live the old life you've been living. Live the new way of life. But he who has called you is holy. You also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Live based on the new way of life. And then revival breaks out. And this this pattern that we're reading in the book of Acts is the pattern that can happen for us in our church, in our state, in our country, and around the world today. It can happen. Acts chapter 2, jump to verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they heard Peter's message, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and were added to that day about 3,000 souls. 
What happened in the book of Acts can happen today. But we need a spirit-filled church that is bold and on fire for the things of God. This is what Pentecost was in the Old Testament, what it was in the New Testament, and what it means for us today as we get ready to close. By the way, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit. John 14, 16, and 17. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. I don't know if anybody's ever felt alone or that God has deserted you. Give your life to Jesus, and you'll never be alone again. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You wonder why th things are falling apart around the world? It makes no, how, how do they not? They can't see him or know him. But thank God that the blind can see. God can heal. God can awaken. And we need a world to be awakened by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Those are the words of Jesus, and I believe it for you today. Those that are here saying, I've never given my life to Jesus, we're going to give you an opportunity in a moment. Those of you that say, I, I grew up in a faith tradition, or I've been living for Jesus a long time, but I've never actually heard that there's this greater infilling of the Holy Spirit. I, I, like, I'm, I'm just kind of leaning in on that, you know, what what is that? I, I, I've not heard this yet before. I, I know many people that grew up in a faith tradition loving Jesus, but never knew about the power of the Holy Spirit. And then when they do, and they're filled with the Spirit of God, they, they never go back. It, it, like, I am now supercharged to accomplish. You're not a greater person or Christian. You are an empowered, Spirit-filled Christian. So it's not about comparison, but it's about the supercharge. It's supernatural that by the power of the Holy Spirit, I now am going to accomplish what I was created to accomplish. You might be here feeling like, I never heard this before. And I just want to talk about that in a moment. But all are filled. You can look up Ephesians 5.18. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. All are given gifts. You can look up 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Peter 4 that describe the gifts of God. All are empowered. We already read Acts 1.8. Receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Spirit-filled churches do this. They enab they're enabled to suffer joyfully even in persecution. So what's the new way of life? The new way of life, a spirit-filled believer or spirit-filled church is enabled to suffer joyfully. A spirit-filled church is a praying and fasting church. They manifest a sense of unity in diversity. A, a spirit-filled church is generous. It's bold. It witnesses. It is scripture-saturated. A spirit-filled church recognizes their desperate need for the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit and desire to be filled. Worshipers, spirit-filled churches are full of worshipers singing joyfully from the heart to exalt the Lord. They're grateful. They walk wise. There are spirit-filled marriages, families, workplaces, spirit-empowered warfare, spirit-initiated prayer life. A, a spirit-filled church is a soul-winning church. A spirit-filled church follows the example of Christ. If you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you can be filled again. Lord, would you fill me again? Would you fill me again? Every day you wake up, Lord, Holy Spirit, would you fill me again? I want to be full of not me, less of me, more of you. I need more of the Holy Spirit. And for those of you that are here saying, I want what the Bible is saying. I want the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And I've never heard about it. I thought I was a Christian. You may be a Christian and can be filled with the Holy Spirit. It is true. When you give your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit moves into your life. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He, he now lives in you. That is true. But there is a separate, distinct work of the Holy Spirit called the baptism or the filling, the infilling of the Holy Spirit where there is greater gifts and there is fruit of the Spirit and there is a confidence and there is an assuredness and there is a, a prayer language and there is there's, God's got more for you. And for those of you that are saying, I've, I've never heard this. Okay, Acts chapter 19 has a great story. 
And this message is not to replace our Holy Spirit retreat. We would love to invite you. And there's, there's a little bit more extended time where you can learn about who is the Holy Spirit, what gifts does he have for us, and how can I be filled? But I believe that Jesus is gonna baptize people in the Holy Spirit tonight. Acts 19, verses one through six. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the, the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. He found, Paul found some believers in Christ. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Christ followers had not yet heard that there was a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. George Wood, the former superintendent of the Assemblies of God, said this. He said, every salvation call, when we end a salvation call, people give their lives to Christ. We should teach people to say, Lord, would you fill me with the Holy Spirit? 